We have ignition sequence start. Short distance, high impact. Five, four, three, two, all engines running. Ten questions with Adam Zwar. Big names, great minds. Make yourself a cup of tea. Liftoff, we have liftoff. Welcome back to 10 Questions. Our guest today is Australian television icon, Dr. Chris Brown. I know you'll find that embarrassing, but I think he's an icon. Dr. Chris graduated from Sydney Uni in 2001 with first class honours in vet science. After practicing in Sydney's North Shore, as well as remote communities in the Northern Territory, a chance meeting in a pub with a media manager saw him land a presenting role on Harry's practice in 2003. The gig landed him a Logie for most popular new talent and led him to write the best-selling book, The Family Guide to Pets. Then in 2008 came the all-conquering reality show Bondi Vet, which chronicled Chris's life at a Bondi Junction vet clinic. Along the way, there were shows for CBS and Animal Planet in the US before he broadened his hosting palette to include The Living Room and I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. We all know he's a naturally hilarious man, but he's also a cricket lover, which we bond over here, and during our chat, he tells a few glorious animal stories, but he also recounts a botched meeting with Nelson Mandela. Well, I thought he handled himself perfectly. He thought it was botched. As usual, I started by asking Dr. Chris when he was most happy. I've got some, I've got some really good friends that live in Finland. And remember when we could travel? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> after... Uh, Look, this, this story may have a lot to do with the quantity of, of schnapps and, and vodka consumed, but we had a, we had a crayfish party uh, in, in the Finnish archipelago on this little island with these very good family friends of ours. And, uh, and you know, at midnight and the sun's still up and you have eaten crayfish and, and and consume your sort of your your body weight in in vodka it's hard not to feel happy about <laughs> about life um and they're just um they're just a joyous people for those three months of the year where the sun actually shines and so um yeah i reckon probably a, a drunken crayfish party in finland is, is probably hard to hard to go past but the sequela to that was that i, I did it, this instagram post and, and for some reason, just did a, a photo of where I was and said, you know, one of the, I'm on one of the you know, 300 islands in Finland and a Finnish online newspaper, I think like the Finnish equivalent of the Daily Mail picked it up and were dramatically insulted and went on this smear campaign over my name um, and my reputation because Finland actually has 900 islands and I'd undersold them on their islands. And, and, you know, Australia loves their wildlife. Finland loves their islands. And <laughs> I insulted the entire country over the number of islands I claimed Finland had had. And they did this big article and try, and basically just really zeroed in on me and, and claimed that I didn't know what I was talking about, that I was an ignorant uh, Australian who, who, should, who should check his facts before he makes such, such insulting statements. I was like, wow, guys, okay. Uh, why did we precious over your islands? But yeah, that was um, it was so it was my happiest moment. Quickly followed by, um, I, I guess, the moment where I, I've had my tail between my legs um, on, on social media the most. Which, you know, if if insulting Finland is your your greatest faux pas in social media, then you, you're probably doing okay. You know, all the things you can be shamed yeah, over. They're such a such a lovely uh, group of people too. But but seemingly, um, you know, everyone has their touch point. Was there any kind of uh, animal that you saved? That's in your mind, and you're kind of going, "Oh, well, that was that was a good day's work." I reckon there is. There, there um, probably a, a moment that really springs to mind is I, I was I was doing a show for for Animal Planet in the US, and I had to go to a different country every week and and help at their wildlife. And look, it it it, it probably doesn't surprise people to realise that at vet school you don't learn the entire animal kingdom. Like you don't mm. learn. A to Z uh, <laughs> through your, your five year degree, and so basically the way I see it, there are like they're basically there are about ten different types of animal, and every animal is just one of those types. So you have like your dogs, your your cats, and a lion is just a very big cat, yeah. Um, and an elephant is just a very big cow with a very funny nose, 
Um, and so with that in mind, I went to Costa Rica and I, uh, I was uh, working as a vet through the wilderness of Costa Rica and we came across a, a sloth that had been, uh, had actually been climbing through the vines of this jungle in Costa Rica and had mistakenly uh, grabbed a power line and had um, damaged its arm quite, quite badly and, and we weren't sure if it was going to make it. Now, I, I couldn't tell the locals at this point that not only had I, had I never, ever worked on a sloth before, I'd never seen a sloth before. Like wow. only in Attenborough documentaries had I ever seen a sloth. And so I'm sort of bumbling my way through bad Spanish trying to work out what's happened and, and where we can take this sloth to, to help it out. And, you know, I, I duck off to the bathroom and Google sloth medicine. <laughs> Wow. And thankfully there was like decent phone reception where I was. So I'm Googling like um, pain relief sloth and, and I'd find some study from some zoo um, in Europe of, of, you know, what medication to give the sloth. So then I'd go back and I'd give the injection and, and then it'd be like, okay, we need to, uh, we need to sedate the sloth. And I'd be like, just need to go to the bathroom again. And, um, and so I'd race off to the bathroom and <laughs> Google um, sedative sloth. And each time I was getting these answers and, and in the end, we, we transferred this sloth to a, a vet hospital. And sloths are amazing animals. That they, they are, you, you would touch this sloth on its shoulder and it would take about 20 seconds to turn around to look at you. Yeah. And, you know, they're so slow moving. They have, they have algae growing on their fur. So they've got this sort of greenish tinge. Um, and so I'm so out of my depth. I, I don't speak the language. I, I don't speak the, the language of, of sloth medicine. Um, but undeterred, we, we go to this vet clinic um, and I managed to convince them to let, to let me use the anaesthetic table and, and the anaesthetic drugs. And I've Googled, you know, the anaesthetic for a sloth. And we end up having to, the, there's no function in the arm and, and there's nothing we can do for the arm. So I ended up having to amputate the, arm the one of the forelimbs of this sloth and again like with us being a sloth everything's slow so its heart rate slows down to you know 30 beats a minute it takes minutes to adjust to to any drug you give um, to respond to the pain is slow everything's slow um, but miraculously um, managed to perform the amputation the sloth wakes up uh, and goes back to the wild a, a couple of days later and no one's the wiser that, that, you know, this is my first sloth encounter. Everyone assumes I'm some sort of sloth expert, <laughs> you know, learn enough Spanish to be able to, to, to uh, say adios to the, to the sloth. But that, that oh, was wow. probably a real highlight where I, I've just gone, okay, th- I really pulled that one out of somewhere um, and had the most, you know, magical encounter with the, one of the strangest yet most beautiful animals you'll ever come across. And that was, um, yeah, that was pretty, that was pretty special. Oh yeah, mate. I mean, I've, I've, well, I was lived in America for a while and, and I, I made friends with a few sloths. <laughs> uh, it, by the way, you know, how you were saying, uh, with, with, you know, that the, the elephant's like the cow and that, you know, the, the domestic has like the, the lion. Um, what was the sloth like? Kind of like a, um, it's, you know, I, I put forward a theory there, and and now I'm just we're just ch- testing if it's watertight. Um, I would say the the sloth. I mean, they eat plants. Oh, it's they've yeah, wow. they're probably they're probably a very small hanging cow, uh, which, which you know I I can, t- can tell you questioning whether this theory really stacks up. No, I love it. I love it. The small <laughs> hanging cow. That's great. Yeah, they're they're just no, nothing about them makes sense. Like the across almost the entire animal kingdom, every animal, whether you're a giraffe, whether you're a human, has seven neck vertebrae. Right, so giraffe have the same number of bones in their neck as we do. They're just really long. Sloth, for for no reason whatsoever, have six, and they're kind of the only animal that does. They're pretty much the only animal that does that. There's some slots have seven, some have six, but they're, they're the only ones that just go, you know what, like let's throw the rule book out. Let's have six instead. 
it's less to turn. It, it's going to save us time in the long run. That's so brilliant. That's brilliant, mate. Yeah, weird. Um, question two, who would you like to apologize to and why? Um, it'd be a lot of people, um, <laughs> but I reckon probably um, yeah, Nelson Mandela is probably one that would, would spring to mind. Uh, I, and, and people hate me for this, but I, I met Nelson Mandela. Wow. Uh, but completely stuffed it up. And I mean, it's obviously too late to apologize. Um, but yeah, I, I was years ago I was, when I was at vet school, we, um, I, I, I skipped a lecture. And I hope it wasn't on sloth medicine, but I did skip a, a lecture and was, uh, was sitting at the front of, of our like vet hospital there. And, and, um, all of a sudden, these uh, federal police vehicles just came screaming in, guys on motorbikes, guys like talking to their wrists, um, you know, Secret Service sort of style. And uh, out of one of the limos gets Nelson Mandela. And it, it kind of, it's one of those moments that doesn't make sense. It, it just all of a sudden, you've gone from just sitting in the sun to, to Nelson Mandela's in front of you. And at the time, he, he was due to give a... To, to receive an honorary doctorate at the University of Sydney and John Howard was going to be there. And it was during the Tampa, children overboard, all sorts of drama and there were a lot of protesters there. So they decided at the last minute to switch it from the Great Hall at City University to um, the Veterinary Conference Centre, just as prestigious, obviously. So Nelson Mandela turns up um, and and so we, um, yeah, he, he's right in front of me. I, I walk up. And there, I have two other mates with me and we think, well, why don't we go and say hi? And the first mate said, um, said to Mandela, look, you know, thank you for everything you've done for, for humankind. Um, you're an incredible man. Um, and then the, the second, second mate said, uh, you're an absolute inspiration. If I can be half the, the person you are, then I've lived a full life. And I'm like, well, it gets to me. And I'm like, well, geez, like all the good stuff <laughs> taken. And I can't just repeat what they've said. And he, he must hear that all the time. Um, and so I'm like, well, what do I say? And then, and then in that instant moment, like the, the idiotic part of my brain takes over. And as he comes over, it shakes my hand. I, I look at him and say, um, Nelson uh, Mandela, I, I, I know you're a massive believer in education, but I just skipped a lecture and look how well it worked out for me. <laughs> And he—it's a good joke, mate. Yeah, look at yeah, sure, sure. Um, and we're, we're still holding, we're still like shaking hands at this point. And I feel the strength of his grip. I just totally disintegrate. And the hand, <laughs> his hand, just pulled away. He didn't even say thank you or nice to meet you. He just nodded and walked off. Wow. And that was that was my Nelson Mandela meeting. Um, which I completely stuffed up, and and you know for obvious reasons I can never, I can never make good on that. I love it. I think he, you know he's probably just going. Actually, that was, like he walked in and thought that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I didn't give that guy. I want to apologise to <laughs> yeah. that guy. Get him over to South Africa sometime. <laughs> That's awesome, mate. Uh, question three is: What is your greatest regret? Probably, probably that. Um, <laughs> oh, apart from that, I, when I was a kid, I. Uh, I'm not a, from an overly musical family. Um, my dad is a vet. My mum uh, was a physio. Um, but every kid goes through that stage of like learning a musical instrument. And uh, I decided, um, I don't really know why, um, I decided to learn the violin. Uh, and so I... Um, I took it the violin and did it for like two years and subjected, you know, family to rehearsals, um, which is which, which is not fit for human ears. I mean, the record is bad, but I reckon the violin may actually be worse um, to be in the household with. And then, you know, school concerts were played, uh, and I just I just really wish that at some point my parents tapped me on the shoulder and said, Chris there's going to come a time in the future where you're going to be at a party and everyone's having a few drinks. Um, no one ever pulls out their violin, <laughs> you know, and there, there is not one guy who's ever picked up a chick 
<laughs> through his incredible violin play at the party. Um, so I, as someone who, who's recently, you know, over the, during COVID taken up the guitar, uh, <laughs> which is another form of torture for anyone that wants to listen. Um, where was that when I was, you know, seven years old? Because that is the instrument you should be yeah. learning. That's, that's where that's where it's at. So I, I, I think musically, I have a lot of regrets um, and, and continue to have a lot of regrets. So, yeah, I, I'd say the violin guitar switch is probably um, probably a big one. And how, what what songs are you learning on it now? Where, where where are you at? Oh, like I, I've I've learned chords. I just I just don't give in to the rhythm. Like I, I it's it's the left. They say the left hand's what you know, and the right hand's what you feel, right? And the left hand's doing the chords, and I can do those, but the right hand, there's just not rhythm. Like I, yeah. I may be called Chris Brown, but but trust me, <laughs> like the, the, the name, the packaging doesn't match match the contents when it comes to, uh, to a sense of rhythm, and ability. Um, because musically, I'm I'm challenged. That is actually another regret. Uh, is is my name because that that name has got me into a lot of uh, a lot of trouble and. And just challenges. Like you go to the states and yeah, yeah. you get on a plane, and w- without fail, the flight attendants will say, "Oh, we thought it was going to be the other Chris Brown." Oh wow! I'm like, oh okay. So you just you just live your life being a disappointment. Yeah, yeah. It's like Stephen Curry, uh, yeah. the actor Steph Curry, the <laughs> basketballer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. But but you know, then again, like. He, he's not exactly like Chris Brown isn't exactly flying the flag of goodwill no. when it comes to, to representing um, the name. So I, th- I think it's a good swap. I think, I think people win out of the, um, yeah. Getting this version. And so. also you can't, you can't uh, fix sloths. There's some, um, yeah. Yeah. He probably can't play the violin. <laughs> That's definitely true. <laughs> um, what would you still need to do to figure you've lived a satisfactory life? What will I need to do? Um, oh, I'm one of those annoying people. That I, I always need to be challenged. I always need to, to I, I, I never like to sit back and do nothing. You know, I, 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 I'm not someone who, who's good holidaying. Like I've always got to find some sort of adventure or some little, some little thing to keep busy with and, and, uh, and, and keep myself occupied. So I, I think to, to live a happy life, Never been that motivated by money. Um, don't tell Channel Ten that. <laughs> um, but I just, I just enjoy, you know, feeling like I, I, my brain's always, always active, and and uh, and and I'm always sort of slightly in the deep end and slightly struggling to, to, to sort of keep above water. I, I kind of enjoy that that challenge of um, of, of being challenged. Mm. Are you one of those people that's like when you get to a new place, you're reading the history of it, you know, you, yeah. all of that kind of uh, yeah. swatting, holiday yeah. swatting, a genuine, a genuine pain in the ass, basically. Um, who, who loves loves a fact, loves some trivia, and and uh, <laughs> and, and, and just likes to, um, yeah, I, I kind of like to 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 squeeze the uh, the sponge of of a of a situation and, and see what you can. Um, what you can get out of it. Yeah, me too. Me too. I'm like that on holidays. Um, yeah. Who is the person who most influenced you and how? Oh, I don't know. Like growing up, I never really, never really had role models. Like I, I, I think I always felt like role models were a, a very dangerous thing because you, it was very easy to be, to be let down by them. Mm. Um, I, I used to, I grew up wanting to, play cricket for Australia. That was always a, a huge, a huge thing. Um, but, you know, some of our, our, our cricketing superstars probably when it came to role model status, you know, occasionally, occasionally let us down. Wasn't a consideration. <laughs> it wasn't a huge thing. Um, so uh, probably in terms of biggest influences, um, I'm, I'm reluctant to say, but, but probably, Probably dad, because um, being being a vet, yeah, as well. But dad's like at the same time he, he is uh, like frighteningly uncomfortable on camera, um, and, and and shuns the li- the limelight at, at any possible um, at any possible moment. So I think um, 
he, he's probably the biggest influence just because he was so against me um, becoming a vet. He, and it, it sounds strange to say that, but I, I used to see him leave for work at 7.30 in the morning, but just before he, he'd rung up, you know, three different owners of animals to tell them their, their pets had passed away overnight oh. um, and, and then wouldn't get home until like nine o'clock at night because um, he, was, he was running the, the local vet hospital. And so I think um, he, I remember having a chat with him and I said, oh, you know, I think I want to be a vet. And he's like, Ser- you act- seriously? Like after everything you've seen, you still want to be, <laughs> you still want to be a vet. Surely I've done a great job at, at putting you off with the realities of, of how hard it can be and, and, and you know, the fact that, uh, that animals, animals don't make it. Mm. Um, but, uh, the, you know, through all the hardship and all, all the loss, th- there were some really special moments. Like we, uh, like one of my clear memories from, uh, from being a kid is this, um, yeah. is this pelican that uh, was called Percy that, uh, that, was, that was brought into dad. And, and this was in the 80s. And it had been stealing fish out of a fisherman's net um, on the central coast of New South Wales. And a fisherman had got a shotgun out and, and shot the pelican and blown its beak off. Oh my God. And, and, and this, the bottom beak was salvageable, but the top beak was totally lost. And so everyone was saying, look, this, this pelican needs to be put down and, and it, it, can't, it can't go on. And, uh, and dad was like, nah, bugger that. I reckon we can, I reckon we can do something. And, and he spoke to, I grew up in Newcastle and, and he spoke to a local surfboard manufacturer and, and shaper. And he got this local surfboard shaper to make a beak out of fiberglass and and they attached it um with these little little rods and and then when i was when i was a kid my job was to feed percy fish and teach him how to fish with this fiberglass beak and wow and so and and that was that's a really clear memory because there's nothing more frightening as for someone who's like three foot tall than a like four foot tall pelican with a sharp fiberglass beak coming <laughs> slapping at you, um, and but he was a demon. He, he, he learned to fish, and he was he was incredible, and and wow. and got himself back together, and eventually got released, and and flew flew away, um, and and went off off to live a, live a happy life. And so I think moments like that kind of inspired me, and 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 I've tried to, I, I love that idea of you know, finding a solution to a problem that's, that's unconventional and, and, and not giving up on things. And, and so uh, I think that was, a, that was probably a, a big inspiration for me. And then, you know, I've been lucky enough to, to I guess, you know, try to bring a little bit of that into, into what I've done with my career uh, as a vet. And, and I, I had a, about oh, probably four or five years ago, I had a cormorant, like those birds with these long skinny beaks that you often see by the beach fishing um, and uh, they're black and white normally. And this cormorant had got its beak, its top beak again, trapped in a crab trap and it had been ripped off. And I got a call from these, um, these twin bird carers up in Queensland who said, oh, um, and I was mates with them and said, oh, they said, would, would you have a look at the bird? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll have a look at it. And realised I could do a Percy on this um, on this cormorant, and so using fiberglass again, we managed to um, to shape a uh, a little beak for this this bird that was imaginatively named Beaky, <laughs> and uh, and Beaky got a fiberglass beak, and and I did that, and and it was kind of inspired by what I'd seen as a kid with Percy the pelican, and and then um, yeah. It, uh, a couple of months later, after learning to fish again with it, um, Beaky the the cormorant went back to the wild and and again um, went off to to live a live a happy life. So oh, that's brilliant. And, and obviously, you know, your dad's been such a big influence on you. Is he proud of you? And is he proud of what you've done? Yeah, he'd never say it though. You know? <laughs> okay. No, it, it's you don't say it. No, it's from Newcastle. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You um, yeah. So, I, I I think so. Like he he. He gets a lot of uh, amusement out of seeing me do my things on on TV. Yeah, yeah, right. And 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 takes great delight in in sort of calling me up and saying, "Oh, 
I saw how you treated that uh, that bird or yeah that dog. I, I'm not sure I would have done it that way. Why why'd you do it that way? Because <laughs> like, I I went through and did my degree about 40 years after you did. And things have things have kind of changed. So um, it sounds yeah, like my I, dad, mate. It sounds like my dad. Oh, it's it's hilarious, isn't it? Like, uh. But you know, yeah, anyway, um, it's uh, I, I was going to ask though, just on in the um, in the firmament of uh, of wildlife people on television, um, mm-hmm. who was your favorite? Were you a Harry Butler guy or you Steve Irwin or you know, I, I reckon, um, I was probably a Leyland Brothers guy, Leyland Brothers, of course, yeah, yeah, and look, <laughs> they were kind of the local, um, the local guys to, to Newcastle, I think, yes. I think they, um, yeah, they were local to the area. And I reckon my affection for them only went up when they built the road stop Uluru oh. on the uh, on the side of the M1 going up um, on the sort of just north of Newcastle. <laughs> I, if, if anyone's ever had the pleasure of or remembers it, it it's it, it was qu- it's quite something. It, it's because it's I'm not even sure if it still exists. Road stop Uluru. Um... Oh, should I look so it up? It, it was a scale model of Uluru. Oh. Um, done in, I reckon it probably was that sprayable concrete with like a frame that you could still see through the concrete. Um, it was the shape was kind of close enough, but not quite right. Um, and I think what really rammed home that the I guess the quality was the fact that there was a a cafeteria and a service station built inside it. Mate, um, it's burnt down. It burnt down. It burnt down uh, in 2018, August 1, 2018. The Rock that, Roadhouse. The ro- <laughs> made by the Leyland Brothers. Yes. It, um, it is a slice of Australian history that probably should have been burnt down, um, <laughs> but just a remarkable piece of... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say eight, late 80s, early 90s um, Australiana mm-hmm. um, that just kind of never quite landed it. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, my only regret is that is that in this day and age, Pauline Hanson can't try to climb it. You know, that, <laughs> that would be... That would be Pauline, you know, to a T. I can't... Now I can't climb the real thing. I'll <laughs> still climb this one. Um, so, yeah, it was... Uh, that was a. So it's the Leyland brothers were your guys, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah great. Yeah. Um, what, 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 what about you? I was a Harry Butler. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm probably a little bit older than you, so that's when Harry. Um, so that was like late seventies, uh, early eighties. I remember Harry doing had this bit where he he got the cameras and he was t- saying there's a snake in in this log. Um, it was a hollow log, and you know, and and he reached his reached his hand in there and whipped out this thing and it was waving around and everything. It was just a piece of leather. And uh, you're only joking. Uh, <laughs> and to my seven year old brain, that was, a, that was good comedy. Yeah. No, it, and it just, it never got, it never got better than that. Like that, that no. And you would have recreated that in your own backyard a <laughs> hundred times. And you would have, you would have floored, you would have floored the locals at skip night yep. on a, uh, on a camping trip. Yes. With, without a doubt, um, obviously that was. Do you do you feel like you know you set a very high bar for yourself when it came to, to comedy after? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it, I realised quickly that those things didn't cut it. Uh, you know, post <laughs> post uh, scout sketch shows. Um, yeah. yeah, no, you, you get some rude awakenings. No, I think I probably moved on to. My dad was actually a bit of an influence. He, he got me onto Bob Newhart and all those kind of, yeah, you know, right. comedians. So that was, I listened to the tapes and everything. But yeah, so I moved on from Harry pretty quickly. But uh, God yeah. bless him. He did some good yeah. things. <laughs> oh, there's, there's so many icons there. And, and even like the Bush Tucker man, I, I think yes. was, he was great. Like in that ridiculously oversized hat. And, you know, I, I just, I really, I used to, that, that was my favourite half hour of the week. Yeah, uh, was, was seeing him do do his do his magic, and you know he's always he was unlucky though. Like he was always getting a flat in his tires, or or um, there was a hole in, in one of his water drums. Yeah. Like it was almost like someone was sabotaging him. Almost like I don't know, Albie Mangles style. <laughs> yes, 
<laughs> yeah. And we broke down. Some of the villagers had to help us out. Yeah. So I thanked them by staying in one of their beds for the <laughs> Yeah, that's I'm right. Quite sure. <laughs> Mate, when was the last time you cried and why? Oh, geez, I, I quite a few times during the Olympics, I reckon. Mm. Um, but I think I think a lot of people did. Uh, but they, you know, they were they were kind of kind of happy ha- happy tears. That I um, I've got a I've got a bad thing where I the any time I you know put down someone's dog, I, I can I can handle it to a point. Mm. Um, but if it's an old man's dog, like the moment an, an old man experiences sadness, you you cry different kind of tears. I reckon like it, it's. Seeing an old man lose his dog um, is uh, is one of the saddest things you'll ever see in your life, and, and it's hard it's hard not to go yeah. and just be a be a blubbering mess um, when uh, when when that happens. Mm. Um, so yeah, that 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 gets me every single time. Um, oh, yeah, I've, I've got a I've got a mum in uh, in aged care with with dementia, and that's uh, that's always that's always hard too, and usually usually brings on the tears because mm. you know. Seeing, seeing someone's um, someone's soul sort of slowly evaporate before your eyes is, is a very uh, is a very hard one as well. Yeah, it, it's just you know noting those little differences and you, and you you see the the changes and and you know the direction everything's going in, but it, it's um, but it's just uh, it doesn't make it any easier to um, to handle. No, no. Question seven is what is your current state of mind? Pretty content. Um, it's sort of been uh, been the the end of the you know this is sort of the end of the year when it comes to uh, a lot of the uh, juggling of, of media and 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 vet and uh, anything else I try to I try to um, throw you know <laughs> try my hand at so mm. um, yeah pretty content pretty pretty uh, a little a little tired but but overall like I kind of um, feeling a little bit more optimistic than I probably was a month ago about about where we might be in 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 six months time yeah yeah um and uh and and just you know a little hopeful that uh that ultimately sanity might might prevail and we and we might find our way um out of this uh this this whole situation um not for a uh a lack of uh, of obstacles and and blundering and and uh, you know incredibly poor decision making by a number of different different groups, but but here we are and we're sort of you know trying to extract the uh, the positives and and uh, yeah and, and so I'm I'm optimistic I'm I'm hopeful uh, and, and feeling like um, yeah we, we hopefully will be okay. And which one of your celebrities over the years? Uh... I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. Has brought you the most happiness. It, it's hard because th- there's been quite a few that have been, I think, great. But I reckon for just pure banter and, and quick wit, and, and and that feeling you, you've really met your match when it comes to mindset and gameplay. Um, I'd say Freddie Flintoff oh, was really? uh, was right up there. Yeah. He, wow. He was he was great. Like I, I always a- admired Freddie just for his competitiveness and mm. and you know that 2005 Ashes series was um, you know one of the most remarkable sporting contests uh, ever and and his role in that was remarkable from a performance point of view but also a sportsmanship point of view. Yeah, I I, there, I, I have been writing about that recently and it's the the fact that he almost brought an end to the careers of Hayden and Gilchrist in, in the sense that mm. like they had their worst series ever. And it was because of a mistake. He actually just bowled around the wicket in a trial match to Gilchrist and got out, got him out because he just worked out that his, yeah. his outswinger would just kind of, um, it would be yeah. unplayable for him. And he did the same thing to Hayden and not both of them averaged like 30 or I think Gilchrist was 27 for the series. Yeah. Unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. Have you have you ever seen that? Um, there's a there was a, a documentary around the, that 2005 series, and they got a bowling machine to bowl to Freddie that amazing over where he he got out you know two or three of the Aussies got Ponting, and I think two others in one over and basically turned the series on its head. And they got Freddie to freight to face Freddie. Oh wow! Bowling that 
and and the bowling machine could generate the same pace, the same angle, and the swing. And he he was he couldn't play himself. Wow. Yeah. That's brilliant. No, I yeah, don't know about that, Doco. That's great. Yeah. And and he he was completely unplayable, even to the guy who who was bowling. Uh, it was scary. Uh, I mean, seeing those guys just pl- you know great batters just rendered useless. Yeah, yeah. It was um it was quite it was quite something and and uh, but but genuinely funny guy and a very but but also now just doesn't want to have anything to do with cricket and openly admits the fact he didn't really even enjoy playing cricket that much. Wow. He was just good at it. Um, I mean, he could have just made that conclusion, you know, before 2005. <laughs> but, but he, uh, yeah, it just doesn't really take that much interest in the game. That's so interesting. Yeah, I mean. He doesn't want, to, doesn't want to commentate it, doesn't want to, um, to really be part of it. Isn't that interesting about people who, are, who, want to, who play it and those who watch it? One doesn't necessarily go with the other. And also crickets change. So, yeah. Um, uh, what do you consider your greatest achievement? A couple of years ago, I was uh, invited over to Africa, uh, to South Africa, to um, to do some um, to do some work with lions, and it was with a guy uh, called the Lion Whisperer. I don't know if you've ever seen him, that Kevin Richardson. And he, yeah, rings a bell. Yeah, he's the guy who who he, he sort of goes out and about with with, um, with lions and and. He can walk into a pride of lions, not necessarily a wild pride, but but you know a pride that he he knows, and just walk amongst them, and they'll wrestle him, and they'll jokingly you know chew on his on the top of his head, but not like press in and brain him with their with their teeth. Um, he's just got this incredible awareness and a knowledge of their body language, and can kind of read them and knows what signals to give back. And so he's um, an incredible guy and, and someone who I'd, I'd always, I remember I was on the project one night and, and they asked me, what do you think about this guy? And I was like, well, I, I, just, I cannot see how he's not going to get eaten like in, in, in the next few months, you know? Mm. And, and, I sort, and I sort of got off air. And I was like, maybe that was a bit unfair on that guy. Like I, and so I did some research into him and I was like, it's actually pretty, it's actually pretty impressive. And, and weirdly, <clears throat> a couple of weeks later, I got a call saying, "Oh, well, um, Kevin has has seen your your vet work, and he and he he wants some help with some of his lines." And I was like, "Really? That that's so strange." And and, and I was like paranoid, thinking, "Geez, did he did he see the project? That is he is he has he somehow found a way to get on ten play um, with a VPN?" <laughs> anyway, he, he had a his favorite line called Napoleon had a facial a, a tumor on its face, just on its lip. And uh, and he wanted to know if I would come over if I happened to be in the area, um, and, and and remove this tumor because he'd seen me operate on on Australian wildlife and and thought I, I'd I'd be good for it. And in the end, like we we we, feel, we thought we'd film it, and we so we went over and and uh, and so I managed to get a crew together and and, uh, and I'd done a little bit of like big cat stuff in zoos, but but not like not a huge amount. But a big cat is just a big cat. Um, it does fit into the model of, of animals. And, uh, and so we went over there and I met, a little bit jet lag, met Napoleon and sure enough, he had, had this big um, uh, tumour on his lip, which weirdly he got from eating uh, horse meat. Um, horses have a thing called sarcoids, which is like a, basically like a contagious tumour. And it can be transferred to lions and lions end up, it looks like a big cold sore um, on, their, on their lip. And... And it was growing and growing into his face. And so the day after I met him, I had to like tranquilize a dart, this lion, and uh, and perform surgery on him. But because it's a facial tumor, you in order to operate on a lion's face, you have to essentially they fall asleep sitting like a dog, and then you lie them down like a cat is like imagine a cat sitting in the sun with its front legs in that sort of sphinx position, front legs forward. And so you are face to face with a lion, but the lion's anesthetized and, and asleep right in front of you. And you lie down face to face so you can get in and actually operate um, on the, the face like that. And, and so you know, it's a hot South African day. We're just outside of Johannesburg. It's bloody hot, humid. I'm sweating just from the stress. 
And the only way you can check how deep under anesthetic the line is, is by tapping its eye. And, and we do the same thing where if you tap your eyelid, you'll blink, right? And that, that blink reflex is a really good gauge for, for anesthetic depth. And so I'd make a cut, tap the eye, make another cut, tap the eye. And it just gets ridiculous because you, you're constantly tapping. But the consequences of the line waking up too early are fairly obvious. Yeah. Um, and because you're right, you're basically in its mouth. Um, and I, I got through the operation and, and you know, took this, this section of the lip out and managed to stitch it back together um, without him having sort of a scowl or without him you know, resembling what scar from the Lion King too much and, uh, and, and put him back together and, and dripping with sweat, tapping the eye and, and he still hasn't woken up and eventually the operation's done and we, and we reverse the sedation and he, and he wakes up and he's fine. And, and so I feel pretty, pretty good about oh. what's, what's just happened and, and, uh, and with all the stress and adrenaline. And so I, I asked Kevin, um, well, can I, now the operation's done, I, there's something I've been meaning to ask. Well, why did you choose me? Why did you get me to come over and, uh, and do the operation? <laughs> he said to me, oh, well, yeah, I was, I was wondering why you hadn't asked that yet because um, it was a fairly logical question. And he said, um, well, yeah, what happened was the last operation we had here, the vet didn't give enough anaesthetic and the lion woke up halfway through and nearly took off his arm. And it was in all the media over here and we couldn't get a vet to come over and you were the only person who actually took the call. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, oh, my God, yeah. mate. So, so that was good. That was, that that was a great good. achievement. That was uh, positive. But it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a great um, yeah, in the deep end moment. And, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still in touch with Kevin and he's, he's a very, uh, he's, he's become a good, good mate of mine. So, um, <sighs> yeah. Dave, what a great story. Mm. Um, who would you like on your side in a battle and why? It's a really good one. Um, you know, I can think of very strong people, very sporty people, um, very inspiring people. But I feel like if I was in a battle, I think I'd, I think I'd go left field Um and I reckon I'd probably take David Attenborough. Oh, wow. That's great. Because ultimately, everyone loves Attenborough. And so they're probably, they'll just back down anyway um, and, and, and just concede. He is the most loved like, human being on the planet. <laughs> but even if it goes badly, at least he would narrate the battle in a really beautiful way. Oh, and you'd have nice. a lasting piece of natural history around your own demise. Um, uh, I think it, I can think of nothing better than than David Attenborough narrating my end. <laughs> so great answer, yeah, great answer, mate. And uh, what would you like your last words to be? <laughs> um, uh, like and subscribe. Um, <laughs> I, maybe I googled everything. You know, I don't Google everything. Um, just just sloth sloth facts. Um, but uh, yeah, I think probably one of <laughs> one of those two would probably would probably get me through. Thank you so much for tuning into Ten Questions. We'd also like to thank all the guests that appear on the show. And if you have a minute, please subscribe via iTunes or your podcast app and leave us a rating. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach me on Twitter at Adam Zwa. So until next time, thanks for joining us.